Welcome everybody and thank you for coming tonight. Uh, my name is Heath. I'm the adult services librarian at Morrill Memorial Library. Um, I'm so glad to see everybody and uh, I'd like to extend a big thank you as always to Progress Norwood and Together Yes for partnering with us uh, on uh, programs like tonight's program. Um, I am going to let Julie Barbara Issa, who is our Progress Rep uh, Norwood representative tonight, um, talk about some upcoming programs and uh, introduce our speaker. So take it away, Julie. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks for coming tonight. Um, I have a couple quick announcements. Um, the November Sustainability Series will um, feature Tori Stevens, who is a climate fiction writer. Um, so that'll be kind of a new and interesting topic. That is November 15th. And then Progress Norwood is also partnering with the Norwood Trails Committee, and we are doing a costume trail hike. I think this is maybe the fourth or fifth year that we've done it. Um, costumes are optional, but encouraged. Um, that is Saturday, October 29th at 2 p.m. at um, the Hawes Park. And then I also wanted to let folks know that um, Norwood DPW does have some home compost options. Um, you can buy a earth machine uh, for $20 at a reduced price. Um, there's a dual tumbler for $50 and there's a kitchen scrap bin that you can get. Um, I'll post a link to that in the chat. And then um, Black Earth does an amazing job. I have a ton of friends who have Black Earth come and do pick up um, at their, um, for their house. They can compost a lot more things, which I'm sure Andrew will get into. So um, yeah, without anything else, uh, Andrew is here from Black Earth Composting and he's gonna tell us about um, his company, what they do, and then really um, as many questions as people have, he can work through all of those. So thank you for joining us, Andrew. Yeah, <clears throat> thank you. Um, and ha how long do we have? Um, we have an hour, so till eight o'clock. Okay. So my name is Andrew, I'm from Black Earth Compost. Um, we're located in Gloucester, Mass. That's where we started uh, 10 years ago. We are kind of unique in the state in that we both do the collection and we do the composting. And that's my part of the business. I came on with uh, Connor who started it uh, 10 years ago. Connor runs the collection side, I run the compost sites. And so we have three sites right now. One is in beautiful Manchester by the sea. One is in Groton, Mass. And one is in Framingham, Mass. Um, <clears throat> and generally speaking, our model is that every 10 towns should have one compost site where trucks go out to the neighboring towns, pick up food straps, come back at the end of the day, and we convert that material into a finished compost that can then go back out to those towns to feed your trees, grow food, um, feed farms, if you have any. I think down in your area, you guys have a bit more farms than some of the more urban areas. Um, so, like I said before, um, the, I'd like to hear from you all on what you want me to talk about, because there's a wide range. We can discuss backyard composting, we can discuss um, collection service and the benefits of compost. Um, and like I said, we can even talk about global fertilizer mining. So let me do a quick screen share and show you a little bit about what we do. And, and you guys can think of questions. So let me get this started. All right, uh, can you all see my screen? Yes. Right. Cool, so this is our website. Um, come to it and 
you got your residential collection, your commercial collection, that's like restaurants, schools, and businesses, and you can buy finished compost. And go down here, type in your address, just say 13 Main Street in Norwood, if that even exists. <laughs> and it says we'll be coming to your area soon. Mm. So what you do is you pre-register here, you enter some information, and then when we open the service, we'll email you to let you know that we're coming. So mm. that that's there. If you want to sign up for collection service, that's the best way to start. Um, let me show you our trucks. So this is our model food strap truck. It's small, lightweight, and um, that, that's good because when you're starting and stopping, going up and down streets to pick up bins, it's nice to be a light, nimble truck. So that's more energy efficient compared to like the large trash trucks where like it's about 30 tons of metal that you have to accelerate, you know, 20 feet to then stop again to get the next bin. So um, that's one advantage we have. These are the green bins right here uh, for collection service. They're pretty uh, robust and you get one with, when you sign up, it's about I think 25 or $30 now. And uh, we do sell liners for these bins. Uh, if you want to keep it clean, otherwise you can, you know, just use it. Um, you know, I personally have probably one of the nastiest bins around, but I'm fine with it and my driver's fine with it, but some people want it clean and that's fine. Um, the countertop bins, we don't sell them, but it sounds like Town Norwood does. And those are great because, uh, yeah, you have that inside and you, use a liner in those. It's like a three gallon liner that you like put inside and you just take, pull that bag out two or three times a week and then drop it in your green bin outside. And that's what keeps that inside area clean. And you have your green bin outside. And we sell the liners through our website. And that's a convenient option because we'll deliver them uh, at our next pickup. How big is the container that you have on your kitchen counter? Uh, about three, three gallons, two gallons, four gallons. I think the bags at most will handle maybe a three gallon. Okay, thank you. Yep. Um, yeah, and so we come every week, we pick up your food straps and we leave your bin. And it usually runs about three to four dollars per household per week. And as more people sign up, then the price drops. So we have different thresholds where like when you get to 300 residents in Norwood or Walpool, then the price drops for everyone. And then more people come on. And then the next threshold is like 800 or a thousand, then the price drops again. And that's really because as you know, as there's more green bins on the street, then, you know, it's more efficient for us. Um, so we can pass on that, those savings to the resident. And that's really been our model the whole time uh, is like provide the service for as low cost as we can. And that's the reason we're in like a hundred uh, towns, you know, from Salisbury down to Falmouth. Um, and yeah, so here's one of our compost sites. This is in Groton, Massachusetts. And so this is our model and we actually run this site for the town of Groton. This is the DPW facility up here. And then we're back at the compost yard. Mm. And mm. so we put this structure up and this is great because 
our food strap trucks, those ones I just showed you, they dump inside and that really uh, prevents a lot of nuisances that you would typically associate with a compost site. Odors, birds, rodents, all that. So like the air inside here is pulled out and pushed into a, a biofilter, which is like a bed of wood chips. So inside the building, we're getting pathogen kill, liquids reduction, and uh, composting. So we make the food disappear. So when it comes out of the building, it just looks like a black homogenous substance. And that's great because otherwise you'd have birds and you definitely don't want birds. So Andrew, can I ask you a question? Go ahead. Um, I'm interested about backyard composting and yep. the combination of um, you know, vegetables from my, you know, clippings from my house and grass or leaves or brown um, components. Could you talk about that a bit? Yep, yeah. Let me touch on that uh, later in the presentation about sure. backyard composting. Um, but basically looking at this here, the concept is very similar. So see how you can't see any food visible at all? That's the same concept you want in your backyard. Um, generally, if you're putting your food straps on top of the pile and you come back and you say that they disappeared, it's because animals ate them. So most backyard composters are really just feeding um, animals. So, and, and, Andrew, the, the compost that you produce, um, is it entirely food scraps? Are there no, um, no yard materials in it at all? Uh -oh. and food waste. So, uh-oh, can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay. We lost heard, you for a bit. Heard the very end of that, and food waste, you said. <laughs> right, <clears throat> so leaves and uh, wood waste. So like, um, like this pile of brush right here, we grind that up and um, that's part of our carbon. And really with composting, so in a lot of ways, this facility that you see, this is um, a facility that's designed to break down yard waste and leaves. And we really use food straps as a tool because the food straps provide moisture and nutrients. And those are both of the things that the microbes need to consume the leaves and the woody debris. You really want to think of the woody debris as like as the a, a fuel source. Like it is raw fuel. Um, sugars, fats, all that, you know, you can burn it in a chemical fire, or you can burn it in the fire of the microbial metabolism. So that's what's going on here is and that, that's really why the um the compost piles heat up because the microbes are consuming the fuel and breathing oxygen and releasing heat it's really no different than what we do as humans you know we we consume food we breathe oxygen we exhale co2 and um your belly gets warm when you eat so the same things happen inside these piles. And the reason they get hot is because the piles are so big that the heat can't escape fast enough. So that's why inside these, these windrows, we call them, uh, the temperature is about 140 to 160 mm -hmm. degrees Fahrenheit. No. And so that is another uh, concept for your backyard pile, which I, I said we weren't going to talk about right now, but um, it's, it's a convenient tool. So like the, you want your backyard pile to be big because you want to hold that um, heat in because you're, you're going to generate very little heat. So 
the leaves are actually act as insulation. So you want your pile at least four feet tall. Um, yeah. All right, so here's, this is our compost site. Uh, here's a new site we're building in Manchester, Mass. So this is all indoor and we're, so our trucks will dump around here and then material moves through the site over three days. And we have air pipes embedded in the concrete floor that push air up underneath. So this is like a high tech facility that we're putting in in Manchester, Mass. Um, and construction will start in 40 days. And wow. I'm the general contractor and never done that before, except <laughs> for the Groton facility. So uh, we're busy and, but it's pretty exciting uh, cause this'll be, um, it'll be a model for where we can do composting where there's neighbors close by. So that's the idea is you get the same benefits as our Groton site, but it's a little more indoors. Mm -hmm. um, this is a wheel loader. That's what we use to turn piles typically. Here's another view of the site. Here's some of the other equipment we use. Uh, so this orange machine is a screener. That's how we separate the, um, the small, the finished compost from like the larger debris, like sticks that didn't break down or rocks and trash. Uh, so this site has three loaders. They only have two right now, but this one's a new loader that we got, the Hitachi with the big bucket. Wow. And um, yeah, it, it feels nice to buy my team like a new loader and that uh, it's nice to, for them to have that to rely on. And it's like 3000 a month for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yep. So I guess that's our compost site. All right. Let me show you one other thing on our website. So buying compost. So I just want to mention about our compost a bit. So our ingredients are over here, leaves, food straps, lobsters, wood shavings, and stuff from the Atlantic. Um, this, this is our recipe for the material that goes in our bags. Uh, our compost has no grass clippings in it. Um, or rather, I should say no grass clippings that contain herbicides, pesticides, and insecticides. So if you are partnered with one of our organic lawn care providers, we will take your grass clippings. But even that's like manual because I, I think they thatch most of them. But um, yeah, there's no grass clippings. It's free of weed seeds because it uh, heats up enough. And we test it for many things such as salts, nutrients, herbicides, using plant trials, um, heavy metals, soil food web biology, uh, PFAS now. So we do as much as we can to make sure it's safe for growing food. And at the end, we, at the end of it, you know, like you can get lab results from, they'll tell you all kinds of stuff, but we, at the end of the day, use plant trials to make sure that our stuff grows plants because plants will integrate all that information that the lab analysis is trying to distill and it will tell you whether the compost is good or not. Plants don't lie. So, uh, yep, compost is screened to five eighths. There is some plastic in it, such as fruit stickers and shreds of bags, but that's just part of the game. It's a recycled product and uh, 
you know, food straps. If you see a fruit sticker, it tells you it's a food strap compost. And that's how you know it's rich. Um, I guess one, so like one big difference between a food strap compost and a grass only compost is, so eat, each of those things are your nutrient source. You're still adding them to a carbon like leaves or wood. But the situation is like grass as a nutrient source isn't that diverse. So um, when you, so the, it means that that compost that results from that is also not gonna be very nutritionally diverse. Now food strap compost, when you're that, the food straps are your nutrient ingredient and food straps contain the bounty of life, essentially. Like think about what food is. It's usually like the seeds. Um, it's, it's the best parts of the plant. Like the plants put all their nutrients and energy into the stuff we eat. We basically eat plant babies. And, you know, as an organism, you put your best into the next generation. And like, that's what we're turning into compost is these wasted, you know, vegetable parts. And that's what makes it rich because the finished compost is also contains those nutrients. So it's a lot easier to turn old food into new food than it is to turn grass into new food. That's my point. So that's why food strap composts are hands down, they will beat out a grass-based compost every single time. I know that's a strong statement, but it's like comparing apples and rocks, something like that. Um, a couple more things. We deliver bulk compost to your home. We deliver our bags direct to your driveway. We have raised beds. Um, and we also have something called compost for yard health, which is about feeding your trees, which I will talk to a little more. And the great suburban drawdown challenge, that's the same thing, feeding your trees here. So I'll talk about that. Like basically we're telling you, we're delivering you compost with instructions on how to draw down carbon by feeding your trees. So I'll talk more about that later. Yep, here's some of our raised beds. Uh, they're tall, so you can, you don't have to bend over as much and it protects it from animals. They're built strong. We have irrigation kits. This bed is gonna last you at least 10 years. I can't guarantee that, but the oldest running bed is at my mom's house and it's six years old right now and it's fine. Um, so, you know, it's not about the wood. You don't need a cedar bed. It's about the construction. I guess, yep. Yeah. And then here's our, our soil analysis from all the years. Got our heavy metals report and PFAS report. All right. Um, so that's who we are a bit. What do you guys want to talk about? So Andrew, there are a couple of questions that have come through uh, in the chat um, while you were explaining things. Um, one thing that a couple of people are wondering is what can you include in composting versus what can you not include? Okay. Yeah, it's a good question. So um, there is a myth out there that you cannot compost animal protein or dairy or anything. So that's completely false. You can compost anything that was once alive. Mm. Um, so, but the reason 
that that myth is out there is because boards of health, um, you know, did a really good information campaign to keep homeowners from putting that stuff into their backyard piles because you should not put that in your backyard pile or it's going to attract rodents. Um, mm -hmm. Also, in theory, you could get sick just because your pile's not getting hot enough to kill pathogens. I think that's uh, kind of rare. But the real reason is because you'd be attracting rodents. Um, so in your backyard pile, you really just want to do your easy stuff like vegetable, like like skins, trimmings, you know, the carrot tops, and tea bags are fine, you know, tea. So even something like bread is going to attract rodents. Mm. Uh, backyard piles are hard. I don't even backyard compost, and I'm probably the most competent in the state to do so. But I just don't have the time, and that's why I use the green bin service. Um, but I will discuss with you a method I have called the bread oven method. I'll do that near the end uh, for how you can backyard compost. And the whole trick is um, camouflage, uh, odor camouflage. Anyways, so that's your backyard pile. Your For our collection service, we do collect uh, all vegetable scraps, breads, cheese, meats, dairy, bones, uh, com certified compostable plates, cups, forks, knives, um, anything that's certified compostable. Uh, and like the compostable bags. So it, it's important to get educated on um, certified compostable stuff. There's three certifiers and they're listed on our website. So, you know, look for their symbol when you're buying. Don't just buy something that says biodegradable or says compostable without a certifier. Um, Yeah, and we have a, a list on our website. Why don't I pop that up real quick? So back to the website. Can you see me? Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. So just going on certified compostables real quick. You need to see one of these symbols. Okay. okay. Not only does this ensure that it breaks down in our compost system, but it also ensures that the resulting compost won't be harmful to plants or humans. And it's the only certification that ensures you don't have PFAS in it. There's no other certification unless it says PFAS free um, that's gonna ensure that. And then going to, think here, Oh, here's some uh, here's mm. your starter kit. Here's the li bin liners. Here's the uh, countertop liners. And then we have this for apartments. So here we go. So if you want to just look for a second, this right. is the range of stuff we offer. Cool, let me check what the next question is while you look at this. Sure, so um, the next question that came in through the chat was how large is the green pickup container, but it looks like it was 13 gallons or four gallons, is that right? Uh, it's 13 gallons. The, that's your counter, uh, I'm sorry, your curbside one. The four <laughs> gallon ones are just for apartments where you know they just have a hallway and they don't have the curb. Okay. And so the next question then is, what is the benefit of composting? Okay. Yeah. So it's the easiest way anyone can have an effect on world peace and climate change. So there's lots of pathways for that statement. And, um, 
but we could just start with the real practical aspect of why food waste should not go in the landfill or the incinerator. So one, vegetables don't burn well to make electricity. Two, and the same reason, vegetables are, food waste is like 80% water. And when you put that into a landfill, which is a pack of trash, a hundred feet thick, that's been compacted, the juice squeezes out and it goes anaerobic and it produces methane, which is bad. And generally this methane is not captured by the landfill. So, and a lot of it comes out before they can even get the capping system on and the capture. But most landfills are too small to even justify the capture. So the other problem is that juice squeezes out and it percolates through the trash pack. It's also gone acidic because it's fermenting. And so now you're acid washing your trash pack and that liquid gets to the bottom of the landfill where hopefully there's a liner, you know, which is only gonna last like a hundred years. And they either pull that liquid out and they don't know what to do with it. So they recirculate it back to the top of the landfill and just keeps going around and they pray to God it doesn't escape the landfill and contaminate groundwater. Or they pull the liquid out and they truck it to a wastewater treatment plant. And then it goes through the wastewater system, which is not really designed to remove pollutants. You know, it's really just designed for nutrients removal. So then, you know, you're, that gets flushed out to the ocean, which is fine, more or less. You know, at the end of the day, we gotta dilute it. It has to go somewhere. So that's why food scraps should not go in the landfill or the incinerator. Now, on the other side of it is that nutrients, the nutrients. Food scraps are packed with nutrients. That's why food scrap composts are so rich. Now, this is where we go to Africa. So, um, nutrients are fertilizer. Fertilizer is mined out of rock from all over the world. And it's incredibly energy intensive. Uh, there's only limited supplies, you know, a couple hundred years, fine. But it's energy intensive and there's a lot of social and geopolitical strife related to all mining practices. Um, the price of fertilizer shot up really high this year because countries wanted to hold on to what fertilizer they produced. So that sucks because the United States is dependent on other countries to send us fertilizer so we can grow the crop every year. That sucks. So by, and here we are throwing those nutrients away into our landfill trash pack is just asinine. Um, so what we're doing is we bring those nutrients contained in the food scraps back to life to be used again to grow food. So we're a local source of fertilizer essentially and you know, if we can get that fertilizer back to farms, that's the best. So we're working on different ways. Uh, we're even working on a liquid fertilizer that would allow us to get those nutrients back to farms to grow food. Because a lot of them, uh, you know, a lot of the nutrients pile up in the urban centers on the Eastern seaboard and, but they're needed back out west to grow food. You know, we're not going to ship compost out west, but maybe we can ship something else. But, so that's why I say 
composting is the easiest way that anyone can have an effect on world peace or climate change. Thanks, Andrew. So uh, our next question, I think the answer is yes, but just to ask it, um, is the compost tested for chemicals at any point? Yes. So we test for salts, nutrients, heavy metals, and herbicides and PFAS. So, you know, PFAS is the latest chemical that is everywhere and the good news is our compost is very low in it and you may have heard news about you know up in Maine farms got contaminated by like paper waste sludge and in central mass there's a composter also taking paper waste sludge and other ingredients that uh, was in the news and contaminated a bunch of well waters so, you know, compared to them, we are barely above background levels. Because um, keep in mind, PFAS is everywhere. It's actually in rain. So um, that means we can't escape it. And it actually, there's just a baseline background because of that. So it's in all soils, you know. And then for heavy metals, like uh, really lead's the only one that is ever in like considered. And again, our compost is close to background levels. Like background levels are, you know, 20 ppm. Here, I'll pull up our lead report. I haven't done that in a while. Cool. All right, so here's our compost over the last, uh, since 2017. So the dark bar is our lead content. And so this bar on the far right is the background level that you'd find if you went into the forest and tested forest soil for lead. So we're barely above background level. Now, you know, there's some municipalities close to Boston that their compost is at 200 ppm. And Black Earth is down between 40 and 30 now. Um, this is what the compost sites lead was before we got here. Um, and so there's places that are 200 ppm. And so the EPA's threshold for is 400. So we're at 10% of that. So up to 400 ppm, it's okay to grow food, they say. 400 to 1,000, you can grow food with restrictions. And after 1,000 ppm, you not grow food. So that's... That comes down to, um, you know, picking the right ingredients and making sure that it's as clean as possible. But at the end of the day, there, you know, there's a residue from society in compost. That's just how it is. There's a residue of society everywhere in your household dust, your lawns, the streets, soil. So there are no you know, fertilizers or soil amendments that floated down from heaven and landed on pillows. Um, so we have two questions in the chat about some local initiatives, which you may or may not the, know the answer to, um, but just to pitch them. One person had asked, uh, how does this differ from the composting that Walpole does at the Robbins Road site? And another person was asking about the Norwood High School um, it sounds like they're trying to get composting at the school. Do you know anything about the school referral program? Yes. Yep. So I, I don't know the Robbins Road facility um, exactly. I imagine it's the town's compost site. And uh, they probably do 
drop off of resident material, leaves, grass, and brush. And right. um, I, I, I don't know how they do. Some municipalities put more effort into it. Some put less in and they, some municipalities don't have enough space to make compost. So they just end up trucking the stuff out, you know, the leaves and others are able to make something. Um, but if they do make compost, it's probably a, you know, leaf and yard compost. Hmm. And so the school initiative, um, yeah, so that's another way that we can, um, yeah. So the school initiative is where green teams can fundraise by getting people to sign up for the residential collection service. And we, I think we pay $5 for every sign up that they get. And that can go towards either you know, bins for composting at the school or can go towards uh, the cost of the collection service or they can use it, you know, for their own funds. If they want to do like a green field trip, they can uh, use that. It's just a fundraising uh, initiative that um, we offer. Okay. Um, so we had a couple of questions from people about the program. Um, so one person asked, uh, what, what's the incentive to join curbside pickup if they already compost at home for their garden? Um, and if you need a certain number of households to join the program for certain price points, then what happens if households drop out of the program? Yep. Um, so yeah, it, if we drop the price, we're just gonna leave it at that. You know, people don't usually, like towns haven't dropped away like that. The programs are all generally growing. So I wouldn't worry about that. Um, <clears throat> I'm sorry, what was the first question? Um, what's the incentive to join the curbside pickup program if they already have a uh, right. compost at home? I guess because we can compost more things than you can in your backyard pile and more volume, I suppose. Um, like just if you need a very large pile to compost like half of a 13 gallon bin at your home every week. So there's that um, and, you know, meat, bones, dairy, the compostable single use items like plates, cups, forks. If you're doing a, if you have a party, get uh, a pack of plates, cups, forks, put your green bin out and just have people toss everything right in there. I'd say the other incentive is ease. The other incentive is winter is hard to yeah. backyard compost. Okay, and if someone were um, considering joining up, would you recommend weekly pickup? Are there any sort of cons to a bi-weekly pickup? I would do weekly pickup, especially if you have children um, or, yeah. If you're a single person at home, yeah, you could do every other week to save some money. And uh, yeah, and it doesn't matter how much you produce, like. You can't produce too little. We will come every week if you're paying us. So you don't have to fill the bin. People think they don't, they can't join because they don't have enough food waste. Okay, we had a question that says, um, doesn't composting plastic bags have a negative effect? Yes, so that's why we, require that bags are compostable and most of them are and certified compostable. But yes, there are some, like you'll always get contamination coming through and, you know, plastic bags can fragment, but that's why we try and get them out before that happens. Um, uh, someone has asked here, um, 
where does black earth compost go? So there's the food scraps. So they'll go to our sites um, like Framingham, Manchester and Groton. And then there's a, so the finished product goes back to gardeners. We put it in bags and we sell it at garden centers uh, or deliver to your home. And we sell to farms. Okay. And um, how close are Norwood and Walpole to meeting the minimum number of households needed? You guys are close. I don't know how close, but it might just be like 20 or 30 people. I'm not sure. But best to um, contact, uh, you know, you use the contact form on our website to, to ask a question like that, get an exact number. Okay, that's all of the questions that have come in through the chat so far. So if anybody else has any other questions, feel free to unmute um, yourself and call it out. Really, really quick. I went and I know someone asked about the uh, countertop compost bin. So I quick ran and got mine. This is my little thing that the town of Norwood sells for $10. And Thank you. Yeah, and it's enough to um, fit like a day or two's worth, depending on what we're eating. If, if you do a watermelon, you know, you go faster. But um, I've got like apple cores and like little leaves from cauliflower and my tea bags and stuff. So, and it has a little um, charcoal filter on the holes. So it doesn't really smell at all unless you open it up. So it's great. Thank you. Yeah. Great, thanks. Here, let me show you. Um... Uh, feeding trees. So we can do this backwards, but uh, essentially um, we are delivering compost in the fall and spring with instructions on how to feed your trees. And let me pull up the instructions. Do, do, do. Here we go. So here's your instructions. And number three is how to feed your trees. So I kind of lay it out here. You want to put compost in the drip line um, because your trees have feeder roots that come up and under. And that's where they're pulling nutrients in. And they're expecting leaves and sticks to be there, but often we take them away every year. So they're kind of deprived and that is a reason why our trees are generally sick and dying and we have to call the tree removal companies often is because we're not feeding them. So what we're proposing is we deliver a small amount of compost, about 10 wheelbarrows worth. And, you know, we give you instructions on how to, uh, you know, find your drip line, lay it out and then rake it out and after you know two rains, it um it all washes in. You don't doesn't look black, and the grass has grown up underneath, and you fed your trees. So it's very easy, and we try to make it affordable so everyone can do it. And you know, this is the easy way to turn your yard into more of a carbon sink than it already is, is by feeding your trees. And I'll just go backwards on this, show you. I don't know how this is coming through, but you can kind of see the process. So now I'm, obviously we're going backwards, but all right. Here, so we'll go forward now. So you go around your tree and you put small amounts of compost down. <laughs> And then use a spring rake and, and you rake it out. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> so then you're done. Um, and I would also encourage people to have like a natural area where you have leaves and sticks on the ground around your tree. So this is our first year with this tree and uh, as the leaves are coming down now, we're, we're just raking them towards the tree, which is really easy. And it actually becomes enjoyable. 
Um, yeah, I don't think anyone really needs to remove leaves off your property. And it's kind of a pain in the butt. Um, I know some people have to take them off their property, but in general, it's a pain in the butt and it's a lot easier to practice. Um, I don't know, feeding your trees with its own leaves than um, bagging them and paying someone to take them away. And Andrew, the, um, the feeding the trees and also the compost for top dressing, can anyone purchase that or do you have to be a subscriber to the program? Anyone can purchase it, yep. Great. May I ask a question about the company? Go ahead. Yeah, so I mean, it's, it's, I had no idea all of this was going on. How big a staff do you have, or do you outsource some of these studies to other places, or how, did, how does this happen? <laughs> uh, yeah, thank you. It's a lot of work, and we have 86 employees right now. We have 35 trucks, three compost sites, and I mean, the lab analysis, we, we send out that, you know, to various labs. Um, yeah. So do you get to fix the trucks too? <laughs> we have a guy to do that. <laughs> well, that's a lot. That is a lot. Yeah. No, that that's why I bought that new loader, I said, for the Groton site. You know, just to, you know, take that work off our plates right, and right. you know, focus on what we need to do, which is make compost. And is it, do you have a turnout? Is it hard, difficult to get drivers? Yeah, yep, it is. But we have good luck. Um, we have good luck with that. I think in part because like people can get behind the mission. We also yeah. offer like good pay and offer benefits because we want people to stay with us year after year. But huh. we do push them. Um, so, yeah. Thank yep. you. You're welcome. Wow, that's a lot. Wow. I'm seeing a couple more uh, chat questions. Um, so there's one person who wants to know how many towns does Black Earth service? Uh, I think they're about 80 or 100. And we have about 30,000 residential customers. Mm -hmm and maybe 80 schools, something like that. Okay. Someone else was asking uh, what to do if there are, you know, what about seeds and compost and what about invasive plants like poison ivy or mint? Yep, so we can take those materials because our compost uh, gets to high enough temperatures to kill them. Mm. Um, you shouldn't put those in your backyard compost and you shouldn't put them in your municipal compost either because the, the municipal site doesn't get enough heat to um, to kill the weed seeds. Uh, are there any options for renters where a couple of renters will pitch in together if the landlord allows a bin? Yeah, sure. Just, just have one of them sign up and just, I don't know, the other one pay them like a buck a week. You know, one green bin, you can fill it up. So if you want to share a bin, go for it. I have a question about apartments or condos, especially if they're sort of the up and down type with multiple uh, homes. Yep. In Walpole, we've gotten questions along those lines like, um, and you have a smaller container for apartments. So do you go inside the apartment or are you setting up apartment house or are you setting up someplace outside where they're putting out their bins? Um, we can do both. Ah, okay. So we can either go inside and you can leave this in the hallway. I believe we do that. Uh, I don't know if we do it in every town, but that'd be a good inquiry for you to do. Um, or if you have the space outside for one of these. Yeah. Or we have even larger totes that you could do too. Um, okay. Like if your apartment has like a trash room and they can have a, you know, 64 gallon tote, you know, the kind with like the one axle in the back. Yeah. 
Okay, thank you. Uh, do we have one last question? I I have a question. If um that that container that goes on your kitchen counter, um, do you have to put it in? I mean, can you put stuff directly into the container and then dump the container into the the larger one, the green one that you're going to pick up? Yep, and then you just need to rinse out the contain your countertop can container each time. Um, yeah. Which is fine, uh, you know, but if your sink is full of dishes, you might not want to, or you can't. So it's like, that's where the bags really make it convenient. I can't stress that enough, um, but you don't need them is the other part of it. So uh, either way, you get them with the starter kit. So, so you can try it out. Looks like my garbage disposal will become um, unnecessary. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I I didn't talk about garbage disposals, but basically you're not recycling the nutrients with those either, because all that is going to into the sewer pipes and goes to the wastewater treatment plant, which is not designed to capture nutrients. In fact, it's designed to dispose of nutrients. So. You're not solving anything doing that either. Okay, um, so we are at eight o'clock. Um, thank you, Andrew, so much for the really yeah. informative uh, question and answer session here. If people have questions uh, after the after we end up uh, wrap up here, how can they get in touch with you or with Black Earth? Um, I'd say fill out the contact form on our website um, and mark on your calendars to order compost for tree health. We do it every late September. So mark on your calendar early September, sign up to get a yard with instructions. I see that as one of the best things we can do in our neighborhood. So that's why I, I push it. All right. Well, thank you so much again. Um, thank you for joining us uh, to everybody um, and especially to Andrew. And again, a thank you, big thank you to Progress Norwood and Together Yes for um, helping us with these presentations. Um, and so I'm going to stop our recording and bid everybody a good night.